name is John Freeman, and I'm here as a member of the Penn World Voices Curatorial Committee. And, or, and Penn, as you know, is an organization whose mission it is to unite writers and allies to celebrate the power of the written word and to champion the freedom to write. We're here today to talk about how the past is marshaled, how it's reimagined and remade in works of history, art, and fiction, and how this project challenges and reveals norms at work then and now. The writers we've gathered here today are here because each one has made a book so radically beautiful. It has created new possibilities in its form for understanding and populating the past and the present as living history. The way each of them writes, Professor Saidiya Hartman and Wayward Lives' beautiful experiment, her exploration of the psychic landscape of freedom and the lives of mostly unknown women from 1890 to 1935, John Keane and Counter Narratives, with its reinterpretation of the story as an epic form capable of looking back at the narratives of imperial history, and, and Adifa Muhammad in The Fortune Men, a historical novel about the life of Mahmoud Matan, the last man executed in Cardiff, Wales, and its thrilling use of an actual court transcript to reveal the fiction that Mahmoud Matan was asked to play each of these books have created a doorway to enlarge discussions, enlarge consciousness, and I know from talking to other writers, future books. We're thrilled to be in this space, in an event space larger than a Zoom screen, our first time two years in Penn uh, to be in real life, 30 events, 80 writers over four days. For those of you who are new to Penn, we're a member-driven organization, and there are members in every state and country from around the world. Indeed, the director of Penn Ukraine was here last night and will be on her way back to Kyiv very soon. So please speak to our colleagues at the membership table following the event to learn more about the benefits of joining Penn. We'd also like to thank our bookstore partner for today. The books for today's event will be in the back, uh, Strand Bookstore. And finally, I'd like to also thank the fellow members of the 2022 Curatorial Committee, Clarice Razaz Sharif, Eloisa Amescua, Deviani Saltzman, and Louise Steinman. Now I'm pleased to introduce today's event, Imagining the Past, Resurrected Narratives, with Saidiya Hartman, John Keane, Nadifa Mohammed, and, and moderated by Joy Bivens. Joy Bivens was recently named as the director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in June 2021. She first joined the Schomburg team in 2020 as associate director of collections and research services. She has nearly two decades of experience in the, curatorial, in the cultural sector and previously served as the chief curator of the forthcoming International African American Museum in Charleston, South Carolina, and the director of the curatorial affairs at the Chicago History Museum. Sadia Hartman is the author of Wayward Lies, Beautiful Experiments, Scenes of Subjection, and Lose Your Mother. A MacArthur Fellow, she's been a Guggenheim Fellow, a Coleman Fellow, and a Fulbright Scholar. And she is a university professor at Columbia University and lives in New York. John R. Keene is the author of Annotations and Counter Narratives, both published by New Directions, as well as several other works, including the poetry collection Seismosis with, with artist Christopher Stackhouse and a translator of Brazilian author Hilda Hilst's novels, Letter of a Seducer. He is the recipient of many awards and fellowships, including a MacArthur Genius Award, the Wyndham Campbell Prize, the Whiting Fic Foundation Prize for Fiction. He teaches at Rutgers University, Newark. Last, Nadifa Muhammad was born in Hargeisa, Somaliland in 1981 and moved to Britain at the age of four. Her first novel, Black Mamba Boy, won the Betty Trask Prize, and her second, Orchard of Lost Souls, won a Somerset Maugham Award. She was selected for the Granta Best of Young British Novelists uh, list in 2013. Her latest book, The Fortune Men, was shortlisted for the 2021 Booker Prize and the Costa Novel Award. She is currently Distinguished Writer in Residence at New York University. Now, please join me in welcoming to the stage these wonderful writers, as well as Joy Bivens, who's going to guide our conversation. <laughs> 
have to be careful here getting in this chair. Good afternoon, everyone. So um, one of the things that I always ask from uh, audiences is that you give us some feedback just so we know that we are in it together. And I am so happy to see all of you, so I'm going to say again, good afternoon. I appreciate that. I know um, the panelists appreciate that too. It's wonderful to be here and to um, be able to have this conversation and wonderful to see you and to be seen in person. You know, this is, it's been a long time, right? So it's good to be among each other. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to uh, engage these fabulous authors in a conversation really about history the use of archives and the creation of literature. And the first thing I want to say is uh, to give a plug to the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, which is in Harlem, New York, 135th Street and Malcolm X Boulevard. And it is uh, an archive of 11 million objects that have been compiled since 1925. So in many ways, it is fitting that I be here to have this conversation because the Schomburg exists as a way of actually claiming space for people of African descent and also for claiming that our history was there when many, when many said there was no history to speak of. So I just wanted to give that plug. You can come visit us at any time. Okay, wonderful. So I wanna get started and um, ask a blanket question and um, make sure that my voice is not, you can all hear me, correct? Um, and that is, since the past is so uh, resonant and so, um, so much a part of the works that we are discussing here, how do you each engage the archive? How do you each go about um, the process of looking to the past or the material culture of the past? And I'll start with you, um, Professor Hartman, since you are right next to me. And of course, of course, I was hoping you would start with someone else. Um, <laughs> so um, even um, as one trained as a scholar, I would say that there is this um, solicitation from the archival object, that there's an encounter. Um, and so uh, a case might you know, really touch you or a photograph and that it can actually take me years to figure out how exactly I'm going to unpack it or, you know, what is my way in and what is the story that I think um, is latent there and that needs to be excavated. So I can have a range of archival documents or objects, but, um, every object doesn't speak to me, right? And so it's not that I come in with, you know, an architecture of what I'm going to do and I seize upon an object and then proceed to work. Um, it's that, the, you know, that archival encounter often determines the path. Yes, I totally agree with that. Um, and first of all, I just want to say what a privilege it is to share a panel with both of you and with Joy. Um, your books are, especially Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, put into words what I've been trying to do in terms of the chorus or the singular person actually being the single voice of a chorus, um, not a solitary tale. And the way that John plays with narratives that are somewhere between truth and fiction is something that I'm also working at. And I agree with the idea that you don't seek out one story in an archive and keep yourself to that. I think it is a solicitation where one element, one small photograph or line, I think for me it was um, a few words from Mahmoud when, in his police interviews when he said something, like, something along the lines of, all I've got to tell you is I didn't kill that woman. <laughs> Um, and that voice, that young, defiant voice was the thing that got me engaged with this story that kept unraveling. Well, let me just also say it's an incredible honor to be on the panel with all of you. Uh, and thank you to everyone for coming out. Um, 
I'm going to agree as well, and I want to sort of focus on uh, what Professor Hartman said in terms of this idea of the encounter, because um, that's one of the components of counter narratives, this idea of encounter with the past, with the archive, with history. Uh, just to give one example, um, one of the stories in counter narratives that was not planned, but that arose specifically, I, I think I'm doing a lot of plosives here, uh, that arose specifically out of an encounter with um, a very interesting archive was, uh, is a story acrobatique about uh, the great um, uh, acrobat, uh, black uh, woman acrobat, Oka Kaira. And that occurred, it was not something I planned to do, but I was at the uh, Morgan Library and happened upon an exhibit on her. And seeing the, uh, I guess, maquettes, the, the, the mock-ups, all of the uh, archival material about her, and reading, walking through this exhibit and seeing, it was Edgar Degas famously painted her in 1879, and seeing and reading about her life in these little glimpses basically just transfixed me. And I said, someone has probably told her story, but I want to be in dialogue with this figure. And out of that came that story. So I think, right, this question of encounter is, uh, the idea of encounter is so important. And sometimes I think, yes, I try to be very careful, but also, also playful, open, and consider it a dialogue. Um, John, I want to stay there for a moment because you, I've heard you mention encountering stories or thinking about, thinking through stories that you would assume had already been written, that you would assume had already been covered, and the idea that those assumptions sometimes are not true, and then they lead you to a, to a different direction. So I, I think I want to talk a little bit about what we assume we'll find when we start the work of, of digging into the archives. Uh, and if, if I, anyone wants to start with that or talk about that a little bit, I think that would be worth it. I'll just follow up by saying, I always approach these things with a sense of belatedness. I always believe, okay, someone has already written about X, Y, Z. And um, so and I think, you know, to give another example from Counter Narratives, there's a story called The Aeronauts about the Balloon Corps in, during the U.S. Civil War. And I was convinced that there were probably a hundred stories, particularly, maybe not a hundred stories about a black figure but uh, in, in the Balloon Corps, but maybe at least two or three. And uh, what I found was that wasn't the case. Now, actually, uh, shortly after that story came out, um, I think Essie Adugian uh, wrote a, a beautiful novel uh, involving um, balloon travel. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure there will be many more. But I think I always think, okay, so someone has happened upon this. And one of the things that I find again and again is, I think we all find this, all of us who are writers and who look at the archive, is that there's so much that has not been explored, right? That is waiting to be explored, right? And that requires, to use uh, one of Professor Hartman's phrases, a certain kind of critical fabulation, right? And particularly if you're thinking in scholarly terms. So I don't want to jump on one of your questions, but I just wanted to say that. No, I mean, we were going to get to that in a moment, but um, it, because we can't not get to it. Um, but I do want to... Uh, kind of shift gears a little bit and one of the things that we were talking about earlier is this idea of personal connection and love um, in, in dealing with these stories and dealing with the archives and so Nadifa, one of the things I've heard you say is when you encountered Mahmoud initially you fell in love with the story, it let you down a, a, a road and um, and, and now here we are. Similarly, um, Professor Hartman, that small photograph of the young girl, the naked young girl, leads you to another place. And so, and, and your work in many ways is a love story or a, a, an engagement a relationship with these subjects. And if you could talk a little bit about what then your work was trying to um, resolve in, in the, just thinking through those relationships? Um, in my case, someone like Mahmoud was familiar to me 
He was my father's generation. They knew each other. They both arrived in Britain in 1947 as sailors from British Somaliland, as it was then. Had crazy, had had already crazy lives even before they'd landed up in Britain. And my father decided to keep on traveling, while Mahmoud was the the parallel to him, who got married to a British Welsh white woman, settled down, had three kids, had really tried to. Um, create a British life for himself. And this is, I guess it was almost a, a cautionary tale of what could have happened. My father almost married a policeman's daughter in Hull um, and then at the last minute pulled out of the relationship. So um, I think my father was more risk averse and I was attracted to Mahmoud's brazenness, his pride, his style, his, um, his inability to adapt really to anything. So he'd run away from Somali land when he was young, traveled all across Africa, and then joined the British Merchant Navy from South Africa. Um, and when you see him trapped in the police um, station, and then in the jail, and then in the courthouse, you, you see a, a six-month trial, emotional trial, of this young man who you want to save, you want to rescue him from that situation, but you know you can't, you know that this is all done but you can't help but form a relationship with him. And in many ways, your, your work does rescue him, right? It, it rescues him for those of us who are not familiar with his particular story, but may be familiar with the larger historical context. Sure. Um, I think I wanted, I wanted him to be a full-bodied person, not a saint, not just a victim, he was a complicated person who had alienated himself from the Somali community, the Muslim community. Um, quite a few number, quite a few black men were um, prosecution witnesses against him, and I found that interesting. He'd, he'd, with with his pride and his slightly obnoxious behaviour, he had made himself very lonely. Um, so that was an element of his story, but so was the fact that. This was part of a pattern of violence, of r- racial, systemic violence across the world at that time. And people were being picked off in Cardiff, in, in Hull, in Mississippi, wherever you were, South Africa, Somaliland. Um, and I wanted to connect the dots and say this isn't about a particular place or a particular time, but this was, this was the way of the world and in many ways still is. But time is critical in each of these in each of these works and um, Professor Hartman I want to talk a little bit about the periodization you use for rest again I think you rescued this young lady this young girl 10 year old girl um, from facelessness namelessness and all of the assumptions that we would have put on that body and if you could talk a little bit about what your project was and in, in, in and kind of reclaiming these lives? It's a big question. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny because, and I'm sure, I don't know if others would agree, I mean, when you start a project, you're often stumbling and in the dark, as opposed to like, oh, this is my big you know, project, and, and I thought I was going to do, be doing one thing um, until I encountered um, that young girl in the photograph, you know, taken in, Aiken's um, studio. I think for me, um, you know, it's so hard in a way to to address these lives um, because, you know, not only because they are anonymous and unknown, but the way the prevailing modalities of thought in many ways make our lives unthinkable. So partly in regard to that dimension of belatedness that you know John spoke of, I feel like you know, I'm often arriving on the scene late and there's a layer of narratives and, and sometimes those narratives help you. Often those narratives, you have to break them to figure out how you're gonna tell your story, right? And um, so I think that, you know, everything I've ever written has been about slavery and freedom, and I think probably for the rest of my life, in one way or another, I'll be writing that. 
um, story. So I was just, you know, thinking about that image as a kind of compelled image and and as a kind of capture. So I was thinking, what does it mean to imagine you're entering a new city as like a free person in this northern city, but the capture that awaits you is so long-standing, not only in terms of slavery, but in terms of this colonial imagination, really thinking about that figure of the odalisque and the way it operates. So um, for me, there's this relation. It's not so much like the past. I think when I think about the past, it's always in a kind of scare quote, because I'm always really thinking about um, that then um, as producing our now and infusing that now. And so there were a set of questions that were opened up um, by the photo that, as Nadifa says, is like, oh, in ways we're still living that moment. So, so what are those questions and how are they opened up? I guess the other thing I would say is, you know, I mean, there's a way that, you know, there can be a kind of, you know, rescue or, I don't know, quote unquote, savior narrative for a certain kind of historical labor. And uh, I think I would want to shift that and, um, and really thinking about, like, you know, the ethical relation or um, the set of ethical agreements between the writer and the people you're writing about, right? And I think for me, because there's so much violence that is a part of these archival encounters that often I encounter these lives as they've been captured and criminalized by the state, like having um, one operating rule is like, you know, don't do any more harm. So, so much harm has been done in my writing. How do I not do more harm? And, you know, I was thinking like for, I don't know, sociologists, anthropologists, scientists, you have to, you know, write those like, you know, human agreement contracts when you're actually dealing with like living people. And I was thinking like, oh, we actually need to do that with characters and people in the past. Like, you know, what are the set of ethical assumptions that need to guide the work so that we don't do more harm and we actually regard these lives in the way that they should be regarded because we know many people are involved in a kind of historical labor and we can say that definitely causes more harm, right? Or that replicates the very violence that they encounter. So what are those, um, you know, what are those ethical arrangements? And love and regard, those are some ways to describe it. And even when that is not the case, just not to do harm um, and to, and to open up a different kind of space for thought, I think are really important. Well, I use love specifically because I think it's a word that we don't employ enough when we're talking about our work um, and the people that we have a responsibility to when we're doing our work so that uh, those... Uh, Myself and Wayward Lives, I mean, I, I talk about it as a kind of love song, so it's certainly, you know, um, and, and I do feel that, and I do feel that love for sure. But I'm thinking also about the, these ethical arrangements. So I used to work for, do research projects when you had to go through an institutional review board and get the consent and, and all of those kind. And in many ways, historical narratives about black people particularly, I'm just... Are, are done with no consent. Our, our names are said with no regard. Our names, are, our stories are told as though we are divorced from a human story. And so, John, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit with you about how you approached your work because you're moving through time and space in so many ways and how, how you uh, navigated those ethical, uh, those lines of love and regard in, in the work that you did. Wow, that's a, that's a wonderful and a huge question. Um, so I'll give you just, here are, here are two examples. Um, one of the stories in Counter Narratives is called Persons and Places. And... One of the, it addresses a moment, just a brief moment, when W.E. Du Bois is a student at Harvard, and he's walking down the street one way, and in the opposite direction, 
is the person who will become his tutor and one of his, really, you know, uh, I think um, his great teachers, uh, who Du Bois mentions, but interestingly enough, that person does not mention him in his actual remarkably, remarkably, remarkably strange memoir, Persons and Places, George Santayana. And I was haunted by a phrase that Du Bois uses when he describes studying Immanuel Kant with um, uh, Santayana. He says, he and I alone in an upper room. So they're sitting side by side, they're reading this German text together, Du Bois can read German, right? And there's this profound proximity, right? Uh, and the kind of engagement. And yet, in Persons and Places, Santayana, he elides really one of the people who would probably be his greatest student. So in thinking about that, and thinking about sort of ethical, the kind of ethical approach, I wanted to try and, uh, to, to first, first of all, acknowledge the limits of what I might know about Du Bois, particularly at that moment, but also to make him as fully realized a character, to, bring, to ensure that his intellect, right, the, the, the reason he's at Harvard, right, which is a very hostile environment, and to, and to make sure that the reader feels that hostility, right, the reader understands that, you know, that, you know, to go back to what Nadif is saying, right, what we what he would have felt, of course, it's clearly different in certain ways, but it still exists today, there's a continuum, to try and portray him as fully and richly as possible, but get to give a glimpse. A sort of parallel to that is, um, the uh, story, story blues about Langston Hughes, who of course is a poet, was, he was my favorite poet as a child, one of my favorite poets. And uh, I was, had been dying to write about Langston Hughes. And there is a very famous poem, uh, not, well, maybe not so famous in, to English speakers, English language speakers, by the great Mexican poet Javier Bill Urrutia. And Bill Urrutia uh, wrote this poem, North Carolina Blues, uh, and dedicates it to Hughes. And it's a poem, it's a very interesting poem uh, in, in Biarrutia's uh, oeuvre because he actually deals with racism in the United States, right? And talks about a lynching in North Carolina. And then at the very end of the poem, it shifts to a kind of, there's like a queer moment, a queer erotic moment, right? Of, of two people together, right? Making love. And I thought, well, you know, what is going on here right now? And one of, the, you know, one of the people who had translated this poem said, oh, you know, they took a road trip to North Carolina and they were probably, you know, were together. And I was thinking, okay, you know, you, you, I'm a fiction writer, right, and a poet, right? You're supposed to be a, a translator and scholar. You, you want to be a little bit more careful with what you're saying, right? Because of course, as we know, anything, when we approach Langston Hughes' life, we want to think very carefully uh, and approach it, you know, uh, approach things based on what, what is, you know, sort of what's there and not just to project. So I was thinking about these two together and thinking about the complexity of, of, of Hughes's life and thinking about the biography, of, you know, the great biography of Hughes and all the things that were written, the things that I've been told by people who actually knew him or knew people who knew him. And I thought, okay, how can I portray him as, again, as fully as possible as this living, breathing, uh, creative, entity and intellectual, right? I mean, he, he, he's talking about poetry. He's thinking about poetics. He's also someone who's a, a desiring, you know, uh, a person, right? So how can, I, how can I do this? So I think in terms of my kind of my ethical relation and moving, uh, you know, through time, I try to always think about the particular moment that I'm writing about, think about the figures, and think about, as, you know, um, the other panelists have said, right, you know, basically, these lives are always mediated. We always get to them through, you know, layers and layers of what's already been laid down. And there's always a discourse, right, that shapes how we understand them. And how can, particularly as a fiction writer, how can I kind of cut through that discourse, right? Cut through the discourse, for example, of coloniality, right? Um, how can I cut through that discourse, the discourse of empire, the discourse of white supremacy, to get actually at who these characters are from the inside? and look out. Wow, thank you. You did answer the very broad question, so I appreciate that. Um, Nadifa, I wanna talk to you about detail because there's a level of detail in, in, in your text that makes me kind of uh, feel, Maku, you know, what he's wearing, that, that hat, you know, on his head, how he's moving through space. And, and 
I wanted to know how you thought about or why that was important to you for us to actually feel, feel like we could smell or taste or use our senses to understand uh, the world he's inhabiting. And then uh, just kind of uh, attached to that is the, the folks he's interacting with. So the other immigrant commute parts of the immigrant community who are telling their stories also, um, who again round out this character, help us to understand what it must have been like to to live in that moment. Thank you. So uh, the level of detail I think came out of obsession. The novel was 600 pages rather than 300 and something, and there was even more detail. <laughs> and it came out of me not being happy with the amount of information I had and constantly searching. Even now, I'm still in conversation with someone else who also is obsessed with this case and we're still sharing information and um, getting, to, getting to the bottom of small little contradictions or things that don't quite make sense. So there was that element, which I, it probably connects to the love as well, where you're not able to let something go. Um, and Mahmoud, and that, and that time, I think it wasn't just him that I fell in love with, but it was the world of Tiger Bay the Stocklands, Cardiff, um, zone full of immigrants with kosher butchers, mosques, uh, Greek barbers, all of it, all in a very, very small, squashed-in neighborhood. Um, and it being almost like a, a, a test tube of what the, Brit what the Britain I've known would become. Um, but, yeah, I loved his style. You know, his clothes were something he put a lot of effort into, you can tell in the images of him, there's only a few images that I've seen, but every element is carefully chosen. Um, and I think you say it in Wayward Lives, beautiful experiments, that the way that people dressed was provocative to people. You know, how dare you come and look so amazing <laughs> to this city? Um, and the Somalis and the, the other black immigrants did the same thing, um, however poor they were. So it was clothes as, as revenge, style as revenge. Um, and I think that was the case in Harlem as well in the 1920s. But when you refer to the people that he was interacting with, there were the other immigrant communities, some of them a little bit wealthier, the Yemenis, or um, more in control of the situation. Um, the murder victim in the novel, Lily is her real name, she was from a Jewish Russian background. So everyone is, there's no um, physical distance between everyone. But there are some cultural differences. There's quite a lot of friction, um, and sometimes not between the people you'd imagine the friction to be. So, as I said, Mahmoud and the other Somali sailors had issues with the Caribbean sailors. And often those, you know, they were very different culturally. And in Home to Harlem, Claude Mackay writes about um, being a stoker. Or the main character is a stoker. And on, in the first few pages, he's sailing back from London to New York, um, and the British white sailors say to him, come with us, you're one of us, you're not one of those stinking coolies. The coolies being the Muslim uh, stokers, who could be Somali, Yemeni, Bengali. Um, so these cultural differences still had impact on, on land, and Mahmoud lived, he lived outside of the Somali community because he had stolen money from the mosque and lived with a group of West African and West Indian men who turned on him. But the archive captures his interactions with the police and the authorities. And in that case, the archive, I keep thinking that it's, it's a type of jail. When you're in an archive, you're in a kind of jail. But you're all, this is also your confessor. If anyone is going to hear your final words, it's this. It's this bureaucracy that will lock up your words and put them behind um, a, a door in an archive somewhere that maybe no one will ever look. So that's it's painful, that's a painful realization. So I didn't feel comfortable in the archive. Um, it was something designed to confuse you. The, the record that the police left made Mahmoud look guilty. But almost 50 years later, his conviction was quashed because it was based on a tissue of lies. Um, I think that was the question. <laughs> well, the question really was just about um, trying to understand how the details flesh out a character, right? So where they're, you know, being able to imagine the space that they inhabit, what they look like, what they smell like, 
um, what their what their hair is like, yeah. all of those kinds of things. I think I do that for myself before I do it for the reader. It's me imagining how his hair would look after six months in jail, where you know he doesn't have any of the products he might have used outside in the open. He's probably ashamed of the way that he looks. There's the constant interactions with the prison doctor, the medical officer who's measuring him, taking his life story. That's where I found out about Mahmoud's backstory. It's from his interviews with the prison doctor. So all of these elements were, they made, I knew he was already familiar to me and they made him even more familiar. Understood, thank you. Um, I always approach any kind of conversations about history as if I were my second year in high school and learning about American history, I'll just say US history, and there being nothing about the history of people of African descent. And what I would have wanted to know as a 15 year old thinking about the past and that it could be broader than this thick, this thick textbook that is sitting in front of me. And how your work is, I, I think, expansive but also has the potential to help that 15 year old understand her connection to the past, but also um, get pretty pissed off about the fact that she's not there, right? That her, the, the ways in which she's erased. And so I'm, uh, Nadifa, you said that the archive felt a little bit like a jail, right? It's, it's, a, it's a place where records are and you go there and you look through them and you do your work and all of that. I always think of the archive as being bigger than that, right? Because for one, the place I work calls into question what an archive is. It is the papers, but it's also the artwork and the music and the sound and all of that kind of, uh, all of those kinds of things. And I think that richness is, is so useful to helping us place ourselves, right? So when you're talking about these young women with their ribbons and their, and, and being really too pretty for where they're coming from, I think it's, it's, it's amazing and, and what helps us to connect to the past in a way that, that we often are not invited to do so. So let, I want to kind of uh, change gears and talk a little bit about aesthetics and uh, how those conversations about dress and fashion, and I do this because I think it's important. I, I sometimes think it gets thrown to the side as if it's not, um, but uh, style as a way of reclaiming uh, the past as well. So if we could talk a little bit about those women in your, young women in your book who, who are really, um, fashioning themselves for uh, a public presentation? Yeah, um, that's, uh, you know, that's a great question. Um, uh, one of the things, and you know, in a reformers or race leaders, I, I, I mean, my favorite thing is like Alexander Crummel, you know, railing on aesthetical Negroes. <laughs> and, and, you know, um, my friend said, oh, that'd be a great name for a band, aesthetical Negroes. <laughs> And, um, but, but I think that what it is is that it's also a, a, a mode of, you know, being in the world and uh, attending to the body that's so at odds with a kind of Protestant, acquisitive work ethic. It is excessive. It is also challenging one's status and place within this hierarchical order where you're in the bottom. And for me, you know, thinking about aesthetics, you know, and thinking about, you know, this uh, commitment to beauty, what Hurston describes as the will to adorn, it was actually really important in actually breaking a certain kind of archival enclosure. So, um, you're right, there's, you know, there's the web and tissue of lies that is what these state documents in fact are. That, even before the kind of the whole um, overdetermination of narrative assumes criminality. So basically the narrative 
um, you know, mechanisms produce that. But in writing about Maddie Jackson um, in Wayward Lives, um, you know, the description of her in the case file, it is the most, you know, um, racist, colonialist discourse around black women in their bodies. I mean, it's really, um, it's horrifying. So, I mean, I could go nowhere with that. So I had to be able to imagine her, right, in order to tell her story. And there was this lovely photograph by F. Hollanday, like a white photographer, but who took these really beautiful you know, pictures of black subjects. And I saw, and I thought, oh, like, that's who Maddie is, right? And just seeing that um, enabled me to kind of, you know, really break out of the enclosure of, you know, what someone like Winter would call, like, you know, the narrative condemnation of the archive to get, um, you know, to her life. And I think that, you know, we live in this, you know, order of, you know, racial capitalism and it has its structure evaluation but so much of what the aesthetic is about is a radical contestation of that order of values so every day people are out with all they have to combat a world that considers you you know disposable expendable unfit so this contestation of values happens in the most quotidian gestures. And that's why beauty um, is so important. I mean, I think that, you know, in the context of an anti-black world, what is more radical than to, to actually to love the self and to kind of recognize value there, to recognize value in one's community, even as, you know, the dominant world is saying, you know, you are nothing, you exist only to serve us. Um, and that's the kind of the radical impulse that's already there that I just try to give voice to. I love that. And I think in many ways, because it, it is what we see, right? So you have these court records, the, the, the documents of those who are policing black communities, and then you have these photographs of beautiful people and you're trying to match the two. And in many ways, um, it makes me wonder, what do you wish was in the uh, archive that could help you to reconstruct these lives? And anyone is free to answer that question. We have about four minutes left of talking. Well, I mean, it, you know, I think uh, one of the things that I, just to kind of uh, follow up uh, with all these wonderful comments is just to say that, you know, you think, I think about things like oral history and uh, how sometimes in oral history we get these deeper textures, right? We get this, we get the, the kind of um, thicker story, right? This richness, not always, but of course, because they're always medi mediated by who's, you know, conducting the history, etc. But I think, you know, for example, looking at uh, some of those accounts, the accounts, for example, uh, after the Civil War by formerly enslaved people, and just sometimes the very particular details that they would give, right? You know, these details that point to all kinds of possibilities of resistance, right? And it's this endless desire for freedom, right? They kind of unlock that prison, right? They unlock those archives for us. They open something up, right? Like the photographs, right, that, that, that are pushing back against or were encountered to, exist encountered to these, you know, kind of uh, official documents, which have tremendous power because as we know, when something is written, right, that, you know, uh, particularly in, you know, uh, American law or British law, once it's written down and, and sort of, you know, it, it becomes, it has a force that the, the oral, you know, doesn't. But just thinking about these accounts and thinking about um, just, just sort of the ways that they open up the possibilities for understanding and, and sort of feeling, you know, uh, these various modes of freedom is something I think that's, it just endlessly fascinates me. And sometimes, you know, like, I think of them as like little nodes of beauty, right? So that's something I always try to be, as a writer, I try to be attentive to and try to bring to my work, right? It, which goes, goes to or sort of points to in a certain way, which I think what you're uh, 
the question you raised uh, for, to Nadifa about detail, right? How absolutely crucial detail is, and detail that points us towards beauty, right? And resistance. So, anyway, I'll stop there. Yeah, um, I was going to add oral history as well. I did a lot. Of, I did a lot of interviews for the Fortune Men with men that had known Mahmoud in different ways. One of them was a prosecution witness, a 92-year-old watchmaker who was still alive, working in London as a watchmaker was still fighting with everyone. So when I saw the man in the archive and I saw the man in front of me, and I, um, he remembered Mahmoud as being very stylish, very good looking. And he kept saying, did you, see what they do to, did you see what they did to him? Did you see what they did to him? And in hindsight, he realized it could have happened to any one of them. And another one was also in his 90s, a Somali sailor who'd been with Mahmoud on his wedding day and then went to sea with him for eight months and he said, he described to me what Mahmoud was like at that time. And he used the Somali term, which kind of means he'd lost it. He had thinned out. And that made much more sense to me of the person I was meeting in the archive, who kept giving the strange answers to questions, who couldn't just say things that would possibly have acquitted him. But he was in mental stress already, I think, before this trial happened, and then being detained for six months, knowing he had not committed this crime, worsened whatever situation he was already in. And what I would like to add to the archive um, is, you know, in Wayward Lives, Wheat of Experiments, there's a mother who goes to see her daughter in one of the detention centers, and she can hear her daughter screaming, and she can't, do, she can't get to her, she can't reach her. So having a sense of how years later, the mother and child made some sense of that experience. I would love to see that. Thank you. I'm very sensitive to using microphones when um, in, in, a, in a crowd. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, this conversation. It's been lovely. Um, we have reached a point where we want to hear questions from you. And we are asking if you have a question, if you would come to the microphone and um, offer your question. And I know you'll get great answers. So please. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm going to read my question to be more clear. In thinking about the archive um, and given the history of violence, how do you manage the pain of what you'll never find because it's been stolen or destroyed? So many stories are lost and some things that have been destroyed can't be retrieved or repaired. And what do you do with the gaps as writers so that you're honoring the truth of what's lost and you remain engaged in this effort to retrieve what you can? That's a big question. Yeah, that, that is a great question. And I would say I try to walk a line because partly you do want to respect what has been lost and not be, um, you know, Eric Santner has this great concept called narrative fetishism, the idea that we could like rush in and fill out all the details of what happened and the violence of that, right? So partly, um, you know, I mean, I think that certainly, um, you know, in John's work, he's, he operates with these kind of implicit silences and opacity structuring the work. That's one way, um, you know, to do that. I mean, I think that there's also, um, you know, for me, the speculative and the imaginative is really, really a key aspect. So there are things that, um, you know, the archive doesn't exercise, at least for me, anymore. And that's why I would describe maybe what I'm involved in as much more a historical poetics, because I think that there's a formative violence that produced an order of statements, and that order of statements can't determine or limit our representation of, you know, black and dispossessed lives. So I think that um, recognizing the violence, honoring the silence, honoring opacity, 
and yet not having our own imaginations colonized by these, you know, by the colonial um, episteme. So I feel that we can, um, you know, that we can tell stories with other kinds of, I don't know if it's evidence or affect or intuition or aspiration. Um, so that's not our only, you know, resource. And there are other practices that also aren't only textual. You know, I mean, we were thinking, um, you know, my great grandfather had a country store, um, and my cousin has now created like an organic farm at that country store that feeds this kind of like urban black community. And I was thinking like, oh, that's a deeply archival practice, right? It's not about writing a story about the place, but it's about working with these histories that are embodied in that land and activating it towards other ends. Other questions? Please. Thank you all so much. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, sticking with questions of the archive and for everybody on the panel, uh, when I was doing my doctoral work, this is like around 2010-ish, uh, a lot of libraries were, at, and I'm on the literary side, a lot of libraries were actually burying their archives, filling up truckloads and burying them underground so nobody would ever see them. They would never see the light of day again. And of course, the justification in the rise of the digital humanities is everything was going to be scanned. You could search it. But you talked about the spontaneity of, of encounter. And for me personally, it was so important to be in the space and moving through the material and just seeing what came out. And this is the same concept of browsing in a bookstore, of course, or in a video store, um, we find things that are, are going to bring us places. So I'm just curious uh, in terms of access, um, and I thought about this, of course, as a teacher too, trying to get students into the archive, um, how you, in your own work, think about bringing people to the archive and, and, sh and opening up access so that this idea of like the archive as property and just being able to kind of hold on to it or restrict access um, is, 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 is not kind of contributing, I think, to, to an overall education of, of who, who should be there, right? Um, or, who, or, you know, who wants to be there. Thank you. I'm happy to go. Um, I completely understand what you're saying, and um, I worked um, at a library in London that was called the Afro-Caribbean um, Library in Clapham Junction. And it was a really special resource. I'd gone there as a reader and then I started working in the whole library, Battersea Library. And they'd, they just started a war against that particular small room where the Afro-Caribbean and um, music and uh, records were and books were kept. And I think a lot of those things ended up thrown away. It was so cruel. It was such a petty act of um, bureaucratic violence. And the strangest thing was that the librarian was of a black background but that didn't protect it. She felt she also had to be part of that, that violence. Um, what I have done in my fiction is try and include as much of the archive as possible. So in The Fortune Men, I decided to step away from reporting on the court case as a, as a writer would, as a novelist would, and let the archive speak for itself. So that whole chapter is verbatim from the archive. I've, I've edited it and you know, reduced it but it is what, exact, exactly what happened in that archive. I think I have, I've added one line, um, and it reads as a, as a play, as a, as a work of fiction, and in many ways it was the work of the police who've created this narrative with characters and motivations and um, a, a whole host of people who are willing to lie um, to get this man executed. And I wanted to compare what writing that's influenced by fact looks like and what the fact look, looks like and which one is actually more reliable. I've, I've probably been more careful in being close to the truth than the police were in 1952. Or, 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 even, or even today, I mean, a, a wrongful imprisonment case, someone who was um, you know, imprisoned in California for 20 years and uh, 
when the case was being, had been opened up and it was on appeal, the police officer said, because there was a document in the file that was totally comprised of lies, and he said, oh, I forgot that I lied. That, that was not like lying is wrong, like, oh, I, you know, had to extort information from this person by creating a file of lies. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that, so in a, in a way that's kind of, you know, you know, I think we have to, just like we have to provincialize Europe as a certain kind of political project, I think we have to also be involved in provincializing the archive too, right? It's not this like, it's not church, right? <laughs> um, uh, so, so yeah, I would just say that. I mean, I think it's also important to attend to like black counter archival projects, Arturo Schomburg, and recently I gave a talk on Toni Morrison's Black Book, right? And that was an attempt to, you know, create an archive of black life with all of these primary documents and images that every person could have in their home. So that was a, a project of, you know, trying to give people access to those things. I mean, um, in Wayward Lives, I mean, there are these archival accounts and they're not simply decorative, right? So there's a way that like, oh, they're kind of jokes hidden in images and arrest cards. So that's a way of, you know, leaving an archival trail for the reader so that people can follow. I don't know, did, oh yeah, there we go. Um, I'll just add that uh, to go back to um, a point uh, that you made, uh, the study, uh, about um, the living archive. I'm also fascinated by, I, I think, you know, uh, when we think about libraries and the importance of libraries, and which are under assault, so I hope everyone keeps in mind that we really must defend our libraries as, you know, to the fullest extent possible um, in every possible way. Funding, access, their freedom to have books, make books available to people, uh, cost, everything. But I'm also thinking about like just physical space itself, right? And how it, uh, it functions as a kind of a, a multiple layers of archive. So one of the things I was, when you asked your question, I was thinking about, uh, there's a project I'm working on now, and part of it is set in uh, on Beacon Hill, when Beacon Hill which is now considered to be, you know, one of the, I think, wealthiest parts of Boston, was predominantly black, or a portion of it was predominantly black. And in writing this, I mean, I had this image of, the, I've looked at the maps from, you know, the uh, late 1700s and early 1800s. I mean, studied them, studied them, studied them, until basically those maps were, and I lived in Boston for 10 years, but so these old maps were imprinted on my head. But then I said, I really want to walk this space. So about maybe, maybe I want to say maybe, 10, 15 years ago, uh, my partner and I were in Boston uh, visiting relatives, and I actually walked those little narrow alleys and up and down the hill and down to the uh, common and back up, and I thought, this is, it's it really kind of, to me, it felt like a, a really uh, kind of fascinating and liberating archival practice because, right, I was thinking, this is the, this is the route that my character would have walked, right? You know, um, <laughs> different clothes, <laughs> you know, wouldn't have had on sneakers, right? <laughs> you know, it would have been, you know, in many ways, psychologically, physically constrained in certain ways, right? In other ways, free. Um, but just thinking about like moving through that space and thinking about the difficulties we often encounter, particularly when it comes to the black archive and space and place. Um, that's something I think we, I, I really hope we think about more, right? You know, um, think about, for example, Weeksville in Brooklyn and how important it is. You know, I mean, at one point, I think uh, a few years ago, Weeksville was in a lot of trouble, right? And um, fortunately, people came through and uh, donated money to keep it alive, but we need spaces like that. And that's a preserved space, but there are many, so many spaces that aren't preserved, right? That aren't set aside, that aren't parts of museums or uh, found protected by foundations, et cetera, or the, or the government, but that are absolutely vital for us to understand, you know, how we've lived, right? And, you know, how we will live going forward. So I'm just going to add to that. I think that's so important um, in, in the sense that we do, in many ways, have to free our own selves from 
our concept of what the archive is and where we can garner information, right? Where, where we can learn about the past and how space is one of those places that we can, we can do that. Um, and also just to mention, the, talk a little bit about accessibility and not, I don't wanna take up too much time. Archives have their own history as well. Like the archival space isn't a static thing. It's not a, a it's not we collect all of this and then we just make it <laughs> accessible or put it out there or there are different waves of thought that come and go within the, the world of processing archives. Sometimes it's uh, more product, less process. That was the big thing 10 years ago. Now it's something different. Now people want folder level um, processing or uh, it, it, it in and it of itself is a process to create archival space, right? So it's, it's not, and people are doing it. There's no, there are no ghosts or, um, as you say, any Holy Spirit's doing it. This is people making decisions about what we will document from today that generations will see in the future. And generationally, there are different interests in the archive as well. I see this a lot with the ways in which contemporary artists are accessing um, textual material and using it in their work. I don't know that Mr. Schomburg would have thought that that would be the case. I mean, you know, there, there's the, the process of collecting, there's the process of processing and making available, and it takes a long time. So I'm uh, just saying that I know that we all want it quickly, but sometimes it takes, it takes time. So just keep that in mind as, as, uh, as well when you're thinking about archives. And I have been asked to wrap it up. Um, and I know that you all will join me in thanking John King, Nadifa Muhammad, and Sadia, Sadia Hartman. In this rich conversation. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank you for coming.